So what we've done is just a quick recap. We have in the first learning outcome, you know, we covered things like uh, digital citizenship. We looked at the role of IT, how IT has expanded in the last 50 years. We looked at certain, you know, developments, things like, you know, the advent of ATMs, the advent of internet. We also looked at things like social media and, you know, what kind of an impact it's having on the personal and public professional lives. So this particular learning outcome generally, uh, you know, basically generally focuses on the covering things which help us understand how the significant developments in the field of IT in particular have changed our personal and professional lifestyle. Now, the focus on the assignment side would be to look at covering some of these tasks to understand what are the significant developments in the last 50 years. So you can look at something like um, in the presentation, which I've shown you the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and you know, obviously 2000s. So if we start with that, we'll probably look at the industrial revolution post World War II and the advent of phone. Then, you know, we basically had the advent of television. Then we had the advent of, you know, mobile phones in the 90s, and then the internet uh, in the 90s. Um, and then in the 2000s, we look at the advent of social media, you know, things like Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. And then in general, you know, um, you could basically uh, through a graph or a chart actually chart out the significant developments which have happened. And then what we have to do in the task 1.2 and 1.3 is basically evaluate how this uh, emergence of IT has actually changed society. So things like communication has become easier, uh, travel distances have reduced, world has become a global village. We are looking at, um, you know, some sort of understanding happening from the government side, uh, which is introduction of reg legislation and rules being done so that there are certain norms and basic uh, laws which are set uh, in terms of, you know, usage of some of these mediums. So for example, when you look at, we took the example of Facebook, in particular uh, so anybody who wants to make or get onto social networking there's a basic terms and condition that you have to be 13 years and over you have to have some um, you know you have to follow some do's and don'ts in terms of what content mm -hmm. you can post cannot post and those bits will be covered you know in terms of the task 1.2 and then task 1.3 is basically more of an elaboration of 1.2 wherein you have to explain how this has changed people's life so here, the example of looking at, you know, work life is what we will look at. Things like remote working has come in, flexible uh, hours in terms of working has come in. IT has allowed uh, people to work flexibly. And it, to the certain extent, the negative side of that would be that because of the IT and automation, which is happening increasingly uh, fast in certain sectors, it is also leading to the loss of jobs. And, you know, um, uh, obviously some of these jobs being taken over by robots, for example, Mm -hmm. uh, the the example of car factory or car manufacturing that we took, wherein the specialist workforce actually uh, takes use of IT. All the drawings and everything are created on the computer. Then you know all the robots actually follow those instructions and then end up you know kind of assembling or you know kind of assembling the chassis. So some part of it is pros, uh, which is advantages. Some parts of it is con, which is disadvantages. So we have to look at how IT is also creating illnesses like metacarpal syndrome, people who type too much, their fingers ache, you know, things like um, uh, you have protective screens because we are in front of the PC more and more. So it's affecting eyesight. So these kind of things in terms of how the changes have, uh, you know, um, happened and how they are affecting people's life, especially at workplace is what we have to cover. Now in the second part, and here you could take up an example of, you know, maybe a simple example of how do you see your kids studying or, you know, maybe PC now going back to 90s you know well white boards with or blackboards as we used to call them chalk and uh, you know slate and the teacher is right but nowadays the technology has changed wherein in the schools teachers use uh, you know advanced electronic whiteboards which basically you know capture the data uh, record the data and it helps you to integrate with pc wherein they can uh, you know also look at things like sharing powerpoint presentations and you know uh, bits and pieces with regards to bringing YouTube and interaction using digital technology. <clears throat> in learning outcome two, what we dwelled on was once we've understood the changes in IT, what we've done in learning outcome two is covered some aspects of what is the role of governance? What is the role of government specifically in handling uh, the changes which have been brought in because of IT and its, uh, so what they've done is they've introduced legislation 
and we have to cover certain uh, legislations in this case and these legislation that we can cover would be things like you know the say for example in the uk what is happening is uh, the government is becoming highly advanced most of your taxes your uh, you know pension your benefits everything is trackable through online so whether you apply for a government license you look at an nhs you open a company you know uk is by far the most advanced country as far as looking at usage of it is concerned within within the government department so mm -hmm. a lot of digitization has happened of data we don't no longer keep files everything is now archived in data centers or you know in cloud and this information is easily retrievable so these advancements have also created complexity of things like you know hacking uh, uh, you know mishandling of data and those places are the places wherein the government has introduced legislation and the legislation which they have introduced has to do with the fact that in the modern world and in today's time the government expects the uh, people who use it to follow certain rules and regulation and this has been defined as something called digital citizenship that means you know we don't no longer get a in national insurance number we have just letter coming through and a number itself is good enough for us to log in and get most of our details which are related to our earnings our taxes and things like that so mm -hmm. As the concept of IT is getting more and more integrated into our lives, the government is introducing, you know, legislation and safeguards basically through legislation to be able to ensure that the data does not fall in wrong hands and people to a certain extent when they use uh, the, uh, you know, IT um, in, in terms of, you know, transactions, e-commerce, banking regulation, they also adhere to certain rules and regulation. A simple example would be, that sometimes what uh, the banks, if you do online banking, is the government has created, you know, obviously Financial Conduct Authority, FCA. It oversees banking regulation and, you know, implementation of banking regulations set by the Bank of England and FCA. Now, he, they, they give you, you know, reminders to say that do not share your password or regularly change your password. You know, these are basic examples of how the government is influencing, uh, you know, the handling of data at the consumer level and this is only possible if they uh, you know create legislation create rules which are then enacted into legislation and acts and at some stage they become mandatory for organizations to follow to provide or deliver these services so when you look at banks they look at delivering services banking services financial services mortgages things like that and everything today is accessible through the internet so you have an internet banking account that means you can access details about your mortgage you can look at your own current account your savings account mm -hmm. but in order to maintain these things and security <laughs> what they have prescribed these rules and regulation and that all falls within the use of uh, or the remit of you know something called digital citizenship mm -hmm. and then we covered you know one or two tasks related to that by expanding into how this is having an impact on uh, you know individual life and living so no longer you know we look at uh, if you look at the 50s and the 60s predominantly if people were working within coal mines in the uk they were you know working within the area or they were not traveling uh, you know quite a lot or afar but because of now it people can work remotely uh, sitting in manchester i can deliver this session so as an example we took the use of it and how this is influencing education itself is changing now instead of going to a classroom you are in you know as an individual you're looking at securing a job first and then parallelly studying up uh, you know using distance learning or blended learning in this case to be able to achieve the qualification as well and this is having an impact on your uh, you know lifestyle uh, and this could be with various factors things like the reduction in cost of tuition fees if you go and study in a university you might be paying 9600 but if you're studying through blended learning or distance learning you're paying one sixth the cost of the same course and you pretty much get the same facilities of learning. But yes, face to face interaction or class interaction might not be there, but you're actually interacting in a virtual classroom. So these are impacts that are ha that the IT is having on individual lives when we are saying we live in within the information age. So here in this task, what we have to basically look at discussing is, you know, what are the code of ethics and what are the key legislation which the government has introduced? Um, which helps us in using IT to make our lives better or you know an example of uh, like I've given you education so things like uh, you know code of ethics could be 
when you look at e-commerce website they have to have encryption of data they should not be storing you know your credit card and other details if they share save it then they should have relevant encryption security measures in place and those are the court of ethics which you know have been defined similarly the bodies to spoke about there are different bodies which kind of you know have uh, looked at the promotion of code of ethics and i within the it professionals so they expect the it professional to you know behave and um, you know kind of adhere to certain code so that as a sector in general the code uh, uh, promotes you know uh, what you call professionalism and people are seen as to be working within a sector which is quite respectable so those are the social issues that we looked at in particular in in terms of understanding you know the uh, learning outcome too and last but not the least we also looked at you know how the access to information so we started off with this particular unit by talking about three different things if you remember we said that there is data then you have information and then you have knowledge, you have knowledge. so yeah. data is raw uh, you know basically information which which is you know you are getting information from newspaper television smartphone mm -hmm. social media but that's on information uh, that's data but the moment you start to interact with data and it becomes something meaningful to you so if for example in in your family if somebody puts a photo on facebook you might you have you might have you know a lot of friends on facebook and because of the network that you have of friends you have friends and friends network with you but you sometimes kind of overlook some of these things because somebody has posted a picture or a or a or a video or something but you don't directly tend to interact with it in terms of liking it or you know uh, putting a comment next to it because it's something which you do not kind of relate to and that is data the moment somebody posts a picture or maybe a content which is relevant to you and you put a like next to it or put a comment next to it then that becomes you know data becomes information because that is something you have started to interact with and at some stage if you use that information to make decision or take uh, make or take decisions then that then at that stage that uh, you know information actually becomes knowledge and here is where we are looking at the use of it uh, which is changing the way we now consume distribute and create information so if you're tweeting that's data you have tweeted but that's data for your followers but as somebody starts to interact with that tweet or reply to that uh, tweet that becomes information and if you pick it up again and you see that there is something important that you need to incorporate or look at that becomes the you know knowledge for you so here the scope of assessing and you know accessing it over a point in time has also changed because the way it is moving so we talked about the example of four screens so in the 60s we had cinemas uh, you know 50s and 60s and 40s and 50s we predominantly had cinemas then in the 60s and 70s when the television came in that became the second screen and then in the 90s when mobile got introduced uh, you know it became the uh, you know say for example after the cinema you had television and then you know mobile phone became the third screen and now you have smart devices like tablets ebooks readers and they have tend to uh, you know occupy the space and they have kind of become the yeah. fourth screen so we talked about how the same information can be accessed across different uh, you know screens sometimes you go into the uh, you know a cinema hall or AFC, for example amc cinemas or you know uh, Odeon and you go and watch a movie but before the movie starts you have a lot of in adverts and other things which keep coming and those are nothing but you know information being bombarded at you but at some stage you also when you access YouTube on the on the phone or on your tablet sometimes you you want to watch a video but it starts off with maybe an advert and that is again information to you so, so what you're seeing is that this particular any form of information that you today want to see you are able to access it across the various screens and the fourth screen which is what we call the mobile phone or the smart screen devices is become really important is because that is something which has become like a watch so if you wear a watch on your wrist you don't go or leave house, leave your house without a phone and that is where the consumption of information is changing so maybe a few years back maybe if you look at the last decade everybody used to watch news predominantly on the television but nowadays people are watching and consuming news on the go by using smart devices like tablets mobile phones and here the accessibility to get this information has is rapidly changing 
And this is all what we have covered in learning outcome two. Now in learning outcome three, before we get into the presentation, a quick summary in terms of what we are looking at and how this will develop further would be that in learning outcome three, what we are trying to do would be to understand the legal issues, the you know legal, ethical, and regulatory issues. So because mm -hmm. um, there's a video which came in to me today, you know, which was basically a story about the person who actually created WhatsApp and how he, you know, how what struggle he has gone through, and you know, WhatsApp today uh, is the um, single last, largest interaction platform outside Facebook wherein about 50 billion messages are sent and received every day so the amount of information the idea of sharing the statistics with you is that when i looked at this story i didn't know who created whatsapp and you know he's a former uh, he's a person who immigrated from ukraine and one of the reasons uh, to cut the story uh, story in short and share it with you is that the person actually created whatsapp because he when he immigrated to the us from ukraine uh, with his mother and grandmother he could not go back uh, to see his father and his father passed away in 1997 mother was diagnosed with cancer she passed away in 2000 so he had that guilt with him that i need to have something which will help me easily communicate and you know um, basically reach my father or reach my parents and that mm -hmm. led to the creation of that was the you know his motivation to look at something in terms of creation which could be something as simple as um, you know uh, an application and that would be absolutely free and he has been fighting obviously this application uh, you know whatsapp was bought by facebook in 2013 or 2014 for 19 billion dollars and he's on the board of facebook now a company which rejected him uh, but the idea of the whole ethos of why I've shared this example with you is that he is one who has kind of created something which has led to free communication happening and the amount of data being created and sent and received just on WhatsApp is 50 billion messages. So we are not talking about text messages which are sent, we are not talking about any other social media, but if you combine maybe lots of different medias like Snapchat, uh, you know, Tinder, you look at Facebook, you look at LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, mm -hmm. you know, we, we are as a as a as a race, as as people, we are producing tremendous amount of data every day. And in order to manage this data, what we also need to do in this particular unit, which is IT and society, we need to understand uh, you know the key issues of how this data can be managed legally, ethically, and in some cases how we can put some regulation around this data so that everybody who uses the advancements in technology, especially in IT, feels safe. And you know, they, they feel that, okay, whatever transactions or whatever they are doing, sharing, uh, you know, is something which is in a very safe environment. So the learning outcome three talks about, you know, primarily looking at understanding the issues around the usage, and what legislation has the government introduced over a point in time and it's still introducing legislation so it's not something which has been defined or set in stone but we are still getting pieces of legislation which is coming in but the idea is here to understand how this uh, uh, you know uh, whole piece of jigsaw works and what are the key uh, you know uh, acts and rules and regulations which have been created and what is the impact from general around the world is that okay yeah yeah okay so not being too uh, you know kind of heavy on on the data but yes now what i'm going to do is switch over to the powerpoint slide just to run through some some of the key bits of information that we've spoken about and uh, what what i would do is then also expand this with a bit of a handout that i will send to you after the session so just going through some of the slides now let's look at what are the three types of issues we are going to study in this one is legal the other is ethical and the third would be you know legislation so legal ethical and legislation is what we're going to study here now let's look at what are the uh, you know uh, it related legal issues that we could face um, you know when we use uh, particularly uh, you know advancement in technology now here what we do see is that people who work within this sector are normally called or classified as something called IT professionals. Is that okay? 
Yeah, yeah, people working within the sector, like if you have people working within the medical sector, you know, health and social care, they'll be called health and social care professionals. People who work within the legal profession, uh, will you know, will be classified as people working, uh, you know, with uh, legal statuses like solicitors, barristers, and things like that. Now, here, if you look at legal issues, what we are looking at is that at some stage, because there are lots of things which are being handled by people, and these um, uh, handling of information typically happens by IT professionals or people who work within this field. Sometimes you will see that they are able to access data or cross boundaries. And that would mean that uh, a simple example here would be that Microsoft, if you have a problem with, say, using Windows, they typically have call, so call centers all over the world. Now, you might be based here in, uh, um, you know, in Staffordshire. If you have a Windows product, you might pick up the phone or, you know, call the customer support and that customer support could be halfway around the world. They will ask for certain pieces of information, things like to confirm what you purchased, when you purchased, and are you still having warranty? And after that, what they will do is they'll tend to provide you some sort of support to resolve that problem. So here, what we do see is there are legal issues which could arise because at some point in time, you end up sharing some of your personal information because they have to verify that you are actually the owner or the person who has actually bought that piece of software. Mm -hmm. Correct? Yeah. So some of the pieces of legislation, you know, we need to understand on the legal side would be things like the Computer Misuse Act. You know, we look at Consumer Protection Act. So sometimes when you buy something and you find that the product is faulty or you're not happy with the products, you can actually go back and return the product in 14 days. But after 14 days or 28 days, which is your statutory right, you, if you find any fault in the product, it's covered under warranty. So these are things which have been introduced in terms of legal, uh, you know, legislation. And this, the, you know, is something which relates to what we would discuss is why there are legal issues. So interpretation of law, sometimes when you get a user manual, you see that, okay, it says guarantee, but the implied meaning is warranty. Guarantee means you will get a replacement for a like-for-like -like product. But a warranty means that they will first try to replace, uh, repair the product. If the product cannot be repaired, then they will try and give you a like-for-like -like replacement. And in some cases, if you end up wanting a brand new product, then in those cases, you might have to pay the difference in terms of price. So sometimes yeah. these things are, you know, uh, they depend on interpretation. And here, they will be classified under something called legal issues. Is that okay? Yeah. Now, when we look at, um, you know, some of the things, so for example, when we look at uh, the role of IT professionals, uh, you know, in, in dealing with these legal issues, what tends to happen is that they are able to address some of these issues head on. That means if you speak to a technical expert, somebody who's an expert on Windows and you're having a problem, they might be able to resolve it remotely or on the internet or using a chat session, giving you some idea of the settings, and they then are able to resolve some of these issues uh, pretty much through remote sessions. Now, in some cases, you might have to leave your product uh, or you know ship your product back to the company for it to be looked at. And in those cases, you know sometimes you will see that there are issues which come about wherein you've sent a product back for repairs, but when it comes back to you, you see there are some scratches on it, or you know it's it's not in the same condition as it, as it was sent and you then have the rights under your uh, you know the under the contract to be able to say that okay you know this is not what i uh, you know sent and i've received this in a bad you know bad condition so you will see that this is these are all such issues which kind of come within the legal remit okay yeah. now um also, just to look at, uh, you know, some additional uh, issues which are related to IT. So, for example, when we look at, you know, computers in a cyber cafe, sometimes you will see that a lot of people come in and log in and use the PC and they don't, they don't kind of forget, they basically forget to log out <coughs> from their account, you know, maybe a mail account. So, if you're using Yahoo, you close the browser and then you've uh, left the PC, but somebody else who comes into that particular PC would then see that if they also have a Yahoo account, <coughs> what they would see is that when you, when you look at the opening the browser, they would then basically have, you know, somebody else's account and details coming on it. 
So what we have to look at is in places wherein things are in public use, what we do tend to see is that, um, <clears throat> let me get some water once again. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So what you get to see, sorry about that. <clears throat> so what you get to see in those places is when you have certain pieces of IT equipment which are in the public use or in public places, there is a legislation which has been put in place to safeguard you know, uh, people's data when they use uh, certain, say, public infrastructure, uh, you know, use of IT within the public infrastructure. So when you look at use of ATM, now by default, when you take out money from the ATM, what tends to happen is, um, you know, you have very clear instructions to use the product. You withdraw the money, and once you withdraw the money, it returns your card. But in some cases, what happens is sometimes if they find that the card is stolen, or if the card is being used fraudulently, then in that case, the ATM actually swallows or gobbles of your of, of the card, and that is done primarily to prevent, you know, fraud or prevent uh, you know misuse of that stolen card happening mm -hmm. so what has happened in this case is that say for example you are at the atm there is a legislation which the government has introduced which basically warns the police that okay you've been forced to withdraw the money so if you have your pin number and you enter your pin number in the reverse order that straight away intimates the police and sends the code to the nearest police station that okay somebody has been forced to withdraw the money now that pieces of legislation which is intelligent pieces of legislation to protect the consumer has been put in place and this is something which also falls within the remit of you know uh, legal issues but has been introduced as a legislation so when you're in distress you're able to use this as a facility within the atm to basically inform the police or inform the bank authorities that you've been your card or you've been forced to misuse your card or somebody is forcing you to the money was that something that you were aware of? No, 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 I didn't know that. Okay, I think this was introduced a couple of years back, wherein if you have your uh, PIN number of your uh, debit card or a credit card and you rever enter it in a reverse order, then if somebody is forcing you to withdraw the money or you know your card is being used or you are in distress, that actually intimates the police and sends that reverse code that you enter of your password whatever it is it actually sends the signal or some sort of a response to the closest police station and to your bank authorities mm. now these are intelligent pieces of legislation which have been introduced and they have been introduced over a point in time after lessons have been learned or you know people have kind of um, uh, had such bad experiences and the it uh, you know industry in general has then come out with these kind of uh, you know innovations which help protect you know uh, data it helps protect your privacy um, you know and in terms of you know obviously you know in in this case of an example you know help you protect from bank fraud which could be uh, you know happening or you've been forced to withdraw money uh, you know at an at a knife point or at a gun gun point from an ATM and these are additional measures which are put in now when we look at the IT legislation there are lots of pieces of IT legislation which have been introduced from time to time as IT advancements are happening. What we are seeing is if there is nothing in the law which kind of covers that aspect, government from time to time has introduced new laws and in some cases added attendance to current laws so that they are uh, you know, incorporating the, uh, the new pieces uh, of, uh, you know, let's put it this way, new pieces or new types of protection which will kind of help protect consumer data, his confidentiality, and to a certain extent, you know, prevent, uh, not a certain extent, to a large extent, prevent fraud uh, in most cases, where, wherein it involves financial uh, matters or money related matters. Now, <clears throat> this particular slide kind of captures, you know, some of the you know, key legislation that we will be looking at in this Learning Outcome 3, so which is Computer Misuse Act. So if you're using a computer in a public place, uh, you know, that means there are certain norms which are said that you can 
when you log in, you log out, you know, and things like that. So if somebody forgets to do it, then nobody can miss you. So there is a law which has been put in place, and these are then, you know, kind of put into practice in relevant locations. You have the Consumer Protection Act, you have Data Protection Act, you have Disability Discrimination Act. That means sometimes if you have a, a special disability or if you have some sort of a disability, then in some cases, it is the responsibility of the employers or the person providing those services to have uh, to make this access available to uh, people who are disabled. So when you look at, um, you know, most marketplaces, for example, when you go to Tesco and, you know, or you're going to a particular public place, which is a government office and things like that, you will see that there has there is, for example, disabled access. That means the doors are much wider. Uh, mm -hmm. to a certain extent, which allow access of wheelchairs and other related equipment uh, in that case. But disability discrimination in the case of IT would be things like if somebody, you know, is colorblind, then there are certain pieces of software or, you know, screen aids which can be put in so that the person can access the computer or can, you know, continue to access. And these are looked into by, you know, the employer. That cannot say that, you know, we will not employ a person who is not able to uh, distinguish between colors. But in some cases, you will see people also put in some, uh, you know, kind of different set of keys. If they know a language or if they know a particular language, you'll see stickering on that. And this is what employers have to take in place so that in some cases you will see employers also provide larger keyboards or ergonomic keyboards, which are split the keys and the keyboard are kind of split apart because it helps the person working with the disability, uh, you know, more, much more effectively. So a lot of legislations have been included and this is being done not just to protect the consumer, but also to ensure that the companies providing these products and services are not, uh, you know, at harm's way from consumers because the piece of legislation ensures protection both for the consumer and also for the provider of these services. So in the subsequent slide, <clears throat> you know what i will the handout that i'm going to send you is rather than cover each of these in 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 greater detail it will be good for you to know these uh, you know acts but uh, what i've done is i'm going to send you a handout which will have all these in a bit more detail for you to read and understand so that you have a basic knowledge of what are these acts and what they entail and what kind of services uh, you know the these basically have in terms of bearing when companies have to implement these acts in their uh, premises now going further what we want to understand is what is the impact which this legislation actually has now and why why have these uh, laws and legislations been introduced over a point of time so the basic reason is that we have had these introduction of laws and legislation is because over the years consumers have had various experiences good bad and ugly and these experiences, because they're happening again and again, and they can tend to kind of point out flaws within the system, that is where the government has stepped in and has created these pieces of legislation. Now, a simple example is a Data Protection Act. Now, when you look at a Data Protection Act, what tends to happen is people who need to handle data need to be aware of what they can or cannot do. So if somebody is handling some sensitive information of you know, individuals with regards to passport, date of birth, national insurance number, then this data can actually be used to uh, you know, look at, uh, can be fraudulently used. Now, in order to protect the identity of the person, sometimes the companies will ask you certain questions which will help them correlate that is the person that they, need, that they need to speak to is the intended person because only that person will have those details things like your date of birth or you know some secret question or maybe a postcode or where you live mm -hmm. and that then helps the companies providing or having access to this information then becomes it gives you a peace of mind gives you a bit of confidence that the person the the information being shared with the company or a, a particular person is something which they understand and will be looking at uh, you know, uh, kind of utilizing that information in a respectable, meaningful manner. So sometimes you will see that the the impact of legislation is to protect the consumer. In short, it is to ensure that only the people who need access to this information get access to it. And the third is, in case they need access to it and they get it, then they know exactly how to then 
you know safely do away with the data or the information so that it does not fall into the wrong hands so that is what the main implications of uh, you know this pieces of legislation are now the other bits that we would want to understand is how is this information stored now from an it terms you know that most computers store information in the form of zeros and ones and this mm -hmm. bit of information is you know the storing of this bit of information in this version is called the ascii format now over the years if you are tuned into the developments happening in it i think in the early 90s when the pcs were introduced we had something called 8 bit in, uh, encryption that has moved to 16 then became 32 then became 64 and today we have 128 and 256 bit encryption uh, methods so when we have service ssl certificate implemented on a website and you see a lock next to it you kind of feel much more secure that my information is going to be transferred securely over a encrypted mm -hmm. network which has say 128 or 256 bit encryption that means it is very difficult for somebody to oh, hack great. into that information yeah. right so this is something as the legislation as the technology is advancing what is happening is the legislation is also being asked to keep up to date uh, and not play catch up so they are also updating this pieces of legislation so that it is able to conform to the advances happening in technology now <clears throat> there are let's look at you know impact of legislation on systems development within the it sector let's look at how does it impact the it sector so for example when we look at some of the good systems which have been introduced, the good systems which have been introduced actually provide benefit to uh, you know people using these services um, in a and they pay for these services themselves. An example is that if you have, for example, um, you know, um, let's put it this way that within a bank which is a which is on a high street and it's a very busy branch, that means it gets more volume of customers uh, during the course of the day. So what the bank then decides to do is it tries to invest in technology, could be, which could be things like if a lot of customers come in to deposit money, then they could have introduced, they introduce something called an automated ATM, which accepts money. And when you deposit money through the envelope route, it is able to reflect in your account within two hours of being uh, dropped into that machine. Mm -hmm. And that then ensures, uh, you know, higher productivity or maybe more efficiency within that branch so that the customers are able to be served you know in a very fast and efficient manner now this is something which is an example of the use of it within the sector or within the banking sector but that use of it making uh, the, the 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 system maybe much more uh, you know uh, quicker and prompt and that is why we call say uh, a good system which has been implemented now, sometimes you will see that even after when systems are implemented, there are changes which are required to be done in terms of its configuration. And what happens is sometimes uh, websites, for example, when they employ something in terms of a new technology, they need to tweak it to get it right, uh, you know, for it to work rightly or efficiently for the customers. So most applications that you see on the IT side today they are designed on a three click system. That means you search, uh, once you search and you find the second part is you find the application and once you found it or found a product, then you buy it, right? Mm -hmm. So when you go on Amazon, a simple example would be that they look at a three click search from taking you to, to, the, pro to the product from uh, you know searching to the product information and then you're buying it in the third click. So the idea of having this is that sometimes when you design systems or when you design websites which use IT, there are continuous tweaks which happen. And these tweaks which are done are primarily done to make sure the design or the way discovery of the products is to happen on Amazon is right and is prompt enough for the customers to kind of you know, come in and enjoy and shop and have an enjoyable experience. So in some of these cases, you will see once a new software is launched or uh, new hardware is installed, they continue to tweak it as per the feedback of the customers so that they get it right and it meets the expectation of the customers from that uh, you know, aspect. Mm -hmm. Then we look at interconnected systems. Now, the reason of looking at interconnected systems would be to understand things like 
um, you know, when you look at the example of sticking to the example of ATM. Now the ATMs to a to us, uh, you know, they are not standalone machines. So when you withdraw money and you check your bank statement on your phone, you typically would instantly see that the money has been debited to your account, which has been withdrawn from the ATM. And that goes to show that the ATMs are connected in the back end to server or infrastructure within the banking system of a particular say bank like Barclays Bank. And here, what we do get to see is that the information is pretty much instantly or in real time as we use the term updated and that happens because of the fact that they are all connected to some sort of a backend correct yeah now sometimes you will see complex interfaces also being introduced now you look at the uh, the uh, let's look at a particular industry wherein you you deal with a lot of sensitive information Let's say, for example, uh, we'll stick to banking industry, but we could also look at, you know, something like, um, say, military. You know, in this case, okay. what they do is they have access to information which basically, um, you know, is quite strategic. But at the same point in time, sometimes when you, um, you know, when you have to retrieve this information, the retrieval of this information has to be as simple as possible. Mm -hmm. So when you look at understanding the mechanics of how, say, for example, the ATMs work, what we do get to see is when you go into an ATM machine and you, you know, type in your key pin, you're able to get access to your account pretty much instantly. And when you get access to that account, you are pretty much having, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, what do you call all all the information that you need, say, for example, your balance, you want to transfer money, you want to withdraw money, you want to look at, uh, you know, uh, say, taking out a statement. So what they've done is they have created an interface which primarily provides you the most common usable features that you would want to access, um, you know, through the route of an ATM. Now, if you have access to online banking on your phone, you do see that the menus on the phone are simplified as compared to something that you will see on a PC or that something when you go into the branch, you know, you'll have to go to different counters. And the idea of doing yeah, that is, yeah. yeah, so they have to look at, there are lots of complex systems which are working together to provide this information. But from a user perspective, the IT then simplifies some of these tools in the form of interfaces, which then allow the consumer to access information on a uh, you know on a very easier or say for example from a very um, um, convenience point of view and that is where we see complex interfaces now there are some laws which have been introduced for one of the laws that we look at briefly is something called the brooks law now here um, you know it talks about something uh, with regards to when you do it project management now, in IT project management, when you look at, uh, you know, um, um, I think things like, uh, you know, um, when you're working on projects which are time bound, for example, and in this uh, particular project, when you look at uh, working, uh, you have to deliver against certain timelines. What we do see is that um, in specific, when things are being done from a project management perspective, you have this law being applied wherein uh, the number of people working on the project is directly proportional to how quickly the project can be finished or can be, you know, brought to a conclusion. I don't know whether you recall, but I think during our, you know, childhood days, we used to encounter problems or, you know, uh, questions in maths, which used to say, if I have two people working on a job, they complete the job in, uh, say, seven days. If I have two people, uh, three people working on the same job, in how many days would they complete? So how we used to do was we used to compete that, okay, how much does one person work and how much time will it take? Mm -hmm. so, and that multiplied by two or four yeah, actually gave us the number. Yeah. yeah. So Brooks Law has been introduced, something which is in project management, and it can then be put to work specifically related to when you look at, um, um, I think in the last couple of years, when we have seen the financial crisis happening, sticking to the example of banking, Banking uses IT extensively. So sometimes when changes are happening within the systems, 
they do send you messages saying that okay we are going to be going to going system maintenance and the system is will become live or will the will not be available you know between midnight of such and such date till five o'clock in the morning and after that it will become normal but what sometimes happens is you have still glitches happening people to log in or you know whatever it is they then do things right and sometimes they follow something called the brooks law to be able to project manage those implementations which are happening uh, because of change of technology within a particular sector so here fred brooks was the chief engineer you know who basically was overseeing a lot of projects and that is why the brooks law is basically uh, you know named behind him and what he did was he said that sometimes when a lot of projects are happening you will see that there are delays happening because the number of people working on that project is less as compared to the number of resources required for it to be completed earlier so if you want me to finish a project i can do that in five days 10 days 15 days but it depends on how many people will have working for me in that particular team which will allow me to finish those jobs up pretty quickly so brooks law is primarily related to you know um, the use of incremental number of people uh, once they are added to the project, it makes uh, it uh, quicker and it uh, consumes less time. And because of which mm -hmm. you have, uh, you know, the work being completed in a faster and much more efficient manner. Productivity, yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Productivity, yes, absolutely. So the the other bits that we look at in terms of legislation is how do how do we deal with now now coming to ethical issues. So we have covered a number of legal issues, but let's look at some of the ethical issues. Now, sometimes you do see that you know you have got hold of somebody's personal information, but it you have a bit of a you know a dilemma that should I use this information? Should I trash it? Should I you know tell the person about it? And that is where these ethical issues come in: is that your morals, you know, your ethics come in, and they kind of mm -hmm. put you in the right direction. So sometimes when you look at personal data, which is things like you know, um, simple example is uh, which is you know not related to IT, but when you look at the paparazzi, you know, basically, um, yeah. for example, the, uh, you know, the announcement of Prince Harry and Miguel Marker, you know, getting married. Now, they've asked for some privacy in terms of their, uh, you know, affairs. Now, if they are persistently followed by, uh, you know, paparazzi and all of the information is being chased up and being put into the papers and things like that, they will be looking at a bit of breaching, uh, you know, their personal or invasion of privacy, as we call it. The technical okay. term is invasion of privacy. That means uh -huh. they have said we want privacy, but you are kind of looking at using IT like telescopic cameras and, you know, hearing equipments to kind of spy on or get on to, you know, the conversations which you, you should not be hearing. And you're kind of infringing on to the use of, you know, uh, usage of uh, personal data or personal conversations like the phone tapping scandal which happened you know mm -hmm. and this was something which was being done without the knowledge of the mps or key people in that position and sun newspaper did it or you know i think whatever the paper did it and there was a big investigation which happened so when people are dealing with personal data you have to look at information privacy you have to look at data privacy and there is a relationship clear relationship between how this collection of data can be done what kind of data could be collected and you know the use of technology there are lots of things which people can use if they put in a professional detective or a consultant and they have ways and means of getting hold of this data but what are the ethical routes you know at, uh, which basically the person needs to follow so that they stop at a place wherein it then leads into invasion of privacy or you are entering into somebody's you know private space so these are issues which primarily will come in within, you know, the ethical issues that we'll discuss. And they are predominantly related to personal data. What kind of personal data is? It could be healthcare records. It could be your previous, uh, you know, criminal records or, uh, you know, uh, investigations which have happened. Uh, sometimes you will see that they also look at your uh, records in terms of, you know, um, say, for example, um, you know, looking at things like, banking buying for example or mm -hmm. uh, certain things which look at when we talk about in the context of google being the big brother that if you use google chrome as a browser it keeps track of all your browsing history now you can opt out of it you know but 
even the web, the history, why does it keep that history is because it's trying to understand what is your behavior while you surf the Internet so that it can serve up advertisements and, you know, emails and other things which are going to be more focused on the type of activity that you are doing on the Internet. So here these are, uh, you know, dealings which can happen with regards to, you know, personal data and this personal data. Uh, you know, has comes in from wide variety of sources, and here is where the ethical issues come into play. So sometimes you will see this legislation. I think was uh, introduced in the early 2000, uh, 2010. Was that if you go on to visit a website, most website if they place a cookie on your browser, have to give you a notice or a pop up saying a cookie will yeah, be placed in your browser. Cookies. Yeah. So this was done primarily because. If a website is or if a company is looking at utilizing the personal information which it wants to collect from a person visiting their website had the obligation to basically declare that they will be placing a cookie and that cookie will help them get or push information in that direction without the knowledge of you know the user so after the introduction of legislation because it kind of fall fell into the ethical issues area the uh, the you know the this particular legislation was introduced and now if you dis if you say no that I don't want information to be collected then either the website you know closes down uh, or you know kind of shuts you out and you are not able to browse the website so in some cases what also we do is sometimes if it's sensitive you click on the terms and conditions to go through the terms and conditions and if you're happy with it then you click OK and that helps you deal with those personal data issues and they all fall within the remit of something called ethical issues mm -hmm. okay yeah now when we know that these issues are ethical there are systems which have to be designed so that they can appropriately warn and you know obviously um, tell the user that these are things uh, you know which which are going to be placed say on the browser when you're browsing a website a cookie will be placed your information that will be taken and these issues have to be discussed uh, you know upfront and to do this what happens is we look at the designing of systems which follow some of these ethical proceedings uh, you know when when they serve up serve up information so if you're visiting a new website and a new website has a cookie policy it will serve you a message and that would mean that you know they are trying to warn you that this will uh, store this this information if you're not happy with it you can close the browser down or if you're happy with it you can accept the cookie and that will be only placed once rather than being placed again and again so here the importance of ethical issues uh, you know would be that we are looking at creating a code of ethics which can be included in the policy guidelines for a company say amazon or ebay wherein they store credit card information uh, because you do regular purchases and they are then clearly defining the responsibilities of users who are going to be associated with these websites as an example and using the different aspects of their information to kind of serve up more promotion so sometimes you would have seen that when you browse the amazon website and you have looked at certain amount of products the next day you will receive an email which would say okay you are looking at these 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 products there are, uh, you know, we can offer these. There are some of the other products which have discount on them, and they serve up this newsletter to you. Now, why would they do this to you? Because one, you've accepted the cookie policy, or you've accepted the policy and procedure. And once you've said that, they have utilized the browsing of the data that you've done on the site to be able to serve up motions to you, which they feel are more relevant to what you were actually searching for in the first place. Right. Yeah. So in this case, the idea of these guidelines is to clearly prohibit, uh, you know, the sharing of information sometimes uh, because you as a user do not want them to send you or share this information with third party. Right. So I think from that aspect, what you what you do see is that there is an importance of designing these code of ethics and these code of ethics can be designed by understanding how they uh, how the companies actually look at using the information the personal information in particular and then how can they commercially benefit from this information 
okay yeah. now sometimes you will see now this ethical code when it is developed you will see that most of the time it is personal in some cases it is organizational right so in personal case what do you do is because you're one particular person and you have a single account with the company or a website so in your case most of the uh, things which they will serve or share or store would be related to you as a person but when you're working within an organization sometimes you have to follow the code of ethics within the organization and that could be provided to you in the staff handbook or a uh, you know handbook of when you join the organization it will say do's and don'ts and these are things that you can do cannot do on the it equipment within the office and that would then form the code of ethics within an organizational level and mm -hmm. if this code of ethics is raised into a legislation or an act at the highest level then they tend to be something called regulatory codes of ethic and those regulatory code of ethics would be things like most financial uh, you know most websites which have which collect financial information or have to collect financial information in terms of payments and things like that have to have say for example a service socket layer ssl certificate implemented on the site so they need to have systems in place which will store this data in an encrypted manner uh, which mm -hmm. will not fall in the hands or will be difficult for the hackers to get hold of so then this level of information when it is developed at that level wherein it becomes a legislation or regulatory would be the third level and sometimes that is why we have to classify that okay are we looking at the ethics a code of ethics from a personal point of view from an organizational point of view or from a legislation point of view mm -hmm. okay now yeah. there are some slides which are put together primarily for you to go through which talk about things like you know why is that, why are ethical issues important or why what is the use of these ethical issues so sometimes when you see these things being implemented on a website like the service socket layer you know a value sign or very sign on the site why does it give you more confidence to deal and do transactions is there is that trust pilot for example you know reviews people have written you know these are things which give you confidence in your mind that you are not dealing with a fly by night operator but you are dealing with a standard organization which follows a lot of codes uh, you know and code of ethics and has guidelines in place to ensure that their staff and people working within the organization who have access to that information adhere to certain guidelines and that is where the confidence comes in you to come back and shop again or you know buy their services or utilize their services again and again isn't it yeah right so these are some slides that are put together primarily looking at you know why these are important now last but not the least let's look at if these issues were not there you know for example if the code of ethics uh, you know uh, legal legislation was not there what could be the drawback of uh, not having them in place for consumers so one of the things that comes to our mind is that you know they would have given rise to a lot of risks so when you look at things like a simple example of implementation of an antivirus software right if you have a current updated antivirus software on your PC, then that would mean that it will either stop uh, malicious attacks or it will not put your computer at risk because the you know it keeps checking in the background that if there are attacks being done or somebody's trying to access your information, then this piece of software actually reduces attacks happening on your PC when you're browsing the internet. So if this code of legislation, these softwares were not there, then they will pose a big risk to you, your equipment, and also the information which you are looking at providing using this equipment. So some of these things we will look at. So one of the key things that we look at is computer threats. And computer threats can primarily come across from malicious programs, hackers, you know, or ant viruses, which tend to kind of, you know, uh, um, break down your operations of your PC and get hold of sensitive information which is there in the, in those pcs so these threats can be minimized or classified you know they have to be minimized but let's look at the types of threats one is physical threat right physical threats would be things like if you have excessive rainfall you know you have or you know you are in an area wherein obviously it's more prone to you know environmental disasters things like water fire pollution things like that 
they would be classified as physical damage or uh, you know threats then there are natural events which are also con constituting uh, threat things like you know earthquakes or if you are living uh, close to a volcano things like you know recent news wherein people in bali in indonesia there's an uh, explore you know there's a volcano which is which might explode and about 100000 people have been evacuated and these are which are called the natural or you know natural disasters or natural events which are threats then you look at threats which could come to you from electrical power you know essential services so things like you know if the light goes off if your internet breaks down then you know you are without the access to the information or without access to you know um, electricity so there are different types of threats now what we are going to concentrate on is threats which are basically technical failures which are related to it so one of the key th reasons key threats that we look at with regards to it would be if you have viruses affecting your pc you have your information being hacked or stolen from your computer it could be things like uh, failures uh, you know while using a piece of equipment so for example if you're using an atm and you're withdrawing money and the light switches off or the light goes off and the atm switches off so there over a point in time after usage what has happened is backup systems are put in place so wherever you have an atm there is a backup battery or a generator in place so if the light goes off it automatically starts keeps the track of last transaction so that you don't lose the transaction and you know you withdraw you're trying to withdraw 200 pounds and the light switches off the atm resets when it restarts it's forgotten that transaction but your bank has still been debited so in order to avoid these threats because of technical failures there are systems or fail proof systems which have been introduced over a point in time after experiences or lessons which have been learned and that is where it tends to you know minimize uh, these threats to consumers when they are using services uh, related to you know it mm -hmm. now one of the other things that we look at is something called digital crime or cyber crime you know and this is primarily to do with hacking so people who deliberately you know try and cause harm or they basically deliberately come in and get access to the information which they are not uh, required to get access to will all fall under the remit of something called cyber crimes so when you see large amount of passports uh, you know uh, say passwords being stolen from a from a, from a company or i think in the last 3 4 days or uh, last week if you were aware there were a lot of bitcoins stolen from a company in poland which you and about i think 100000 bitcoins were stolen and because bitcoins uh, they are you know quite valuable now the mining and that company which used to do mining for its clients has lost i think in excess of 10000 or if i am correct i think it was 100000 bitcoins now these were crimes which are committed deliberately nobody can come in and you know no why would you want to steal somebody yeah, or yeah, somebody's yeah, information like that, yeah. yeah but because if you are doing it deliberately then these are offenses which are being done to genuinely harm individuals and in some cases because you have lots of technology now available through which you can you know do these crimes they are all classified under the category of something called cyber crimes mm -hmm. and just to give you an idea now we have you know our debit cards we can tap the debit card onto the machine rather than you know putting a pin in chip and pin in so if you look at 10 years back or 12 years back 15 years back the debit cards were not chip and pin we used to swipe the card and the teller at the other end or the person charging us for the transaction used to take a signature about 15 years back but then mm -hmm. signatures could be forged and that is where the banks then adopted a new uh, technology and that was called chip and pin so when chip and pin was introduced it reduced the usage of uh, you know uh, uh, fraud online because if you did not have the three digit cvv code you know as they call it cvv code yeah. then even if you had the card number and other details you could not still transact using that card so these were uh, you know enhancement which basically uh you know reduced the uh, rate of uh, crime which was being done using card fraud so credit card verification value which is cvv if you don't put your three digit cvv number there is no way that you can do e commerce transaction on the website mm -hmm. but if somebody deliberately tries to use numbers 
and through a fraudulent use try and use these uh, you know uh, techniques to get access to your uh, card to for spending purposes online then this will be classified as something called cyber crime and cyber crime uh, because it gets committed a lot of money is lost information is lost there are now rules and regulation which most government have put in place to deal with these kind of crimes and they all fall within the uh, they all basically pose risk to you know the it equipment which is being used to transact or to share or you know send information uh -huh. okay now yeah. you do get to see there is something called a legal disclaimer in emails sometimes you see an email disclaimer or a privacy policy that you get to see on the website and these are things which you know most people have to declare in terms of if they have if they are anonymously collecting information when you go on to their site or on their premises or on a website and if they are collecting such information then they are bound to kind of publish these guidelines to say that what is this information used for what is collected mm -hmm. what is what is it going to be used for and will that information be shared with third party agencies or other organizations within that group so here most companies have to publish something called a privacy policy and the privacy policy is primarily published so that if they are collecting information then they declare before they collect this information that what this information will be used for and where uh, this information will be stored and for how long it will be stored so one of the other things which tends to happen is that uh, you look at the websites in particular have to kind of publish something called privacy policy and privacy policy here is basically the ability of an individual or group to seclude themselves so if you don't want the information to be stored sometimes what you do is you browse the website in a stealth mode you know using your browser that means you're not invisible to where you're coming from and where you're browsing it and the information is then stored uh, on the websites that you go and sometimes if you refuse uh, to accept the cookie then what they will do is they'll ask you to close the browser or you know uh, they will not serve this information to you but if they do then they have to kind of clearly declare under the privacy policy of why this information is being collected and you know where it will be stored and what it will be used for mm -hmm. yeah. and let's go to one or two last things before we you know kind of understand and bring this to a bit of a closure is that when you look at um you know security now there are different types of security which uh, you know we will look at from a point of view of this uh, uh, you know risks which are associated with it now in some cases what we look at is um why is the you know information security required so information security or it security in certain cases has, is required because what we want to do is we want to create a mechanism which restricts the access of information to employees or or you know say in in general for any person a simple example that i would give here would be when you look at an hr manager within a company the hr manager has access to a lot of personal data or personal records within the organization right now mm -hmm. in most organization what happens is once this personal information is stored even the manager has to gain an access to be able to access this uh, or get hold of this information if and when they require it and they have to go through certain permissions or certain you know procedural patterns to be able to get access to the information so the reason is is reason is because they do not want this information to be used for any discriminatory or any other such purposes which would harm the employee or harm the uh, you know put put the employee into some sort of a disadvantage and in those cases you will see that sometimes they put some sort of a restriction in terms of access to this information so that or levels which are put in so that certain types of employees or certain levels of employees only get access to that information correct yeah we have almost kind of seen this in movies sometimes what happens is you see that this access your access is denied access is denied so when you have networks within companies and the data is stored on centralized servers they put some sort of a virtual private network or a security level in place under the vpns is wherein you need to be of a certain level or authority to be able to get access to that folder or that particular data in that folder yeah. and that is normally restricted to line managers or you know 
administrative managers because mm-hmm. if i'm working with you as a colleague then i don't need access to your personal information but my manager or our manager would need access to it for certain reasons and he would be then authorized or have that level of access to be able to uh, you know see that information and that is something which is put in place through you know security measures within the it equipment so could be basically network access password access or you know access which can be only authorized uh, when you try want to gain that information through the use of passwords and other things like that mm-hmm. now the other bit that we do do see is that we also want to make sure that the information that is held in a particular case by say a company department whatever it is that information is secure right so when you look at a lot of agencies which are crime agencies like police and you know um, uh, agencies which generally have sensitive information there they need to ensure that the information is not only uh, you know stored but it is also stored securely that means the data should not be lost and imagine a situation an example that i would give here is if you again you're going back to the banking industry or uh, financial uh, transactions now if imagine if the bank ends up losing your financial transactions you know and you don't have a copy of the financial transactions for your last month so you can if you have to go and challenge what will happen you will say okay i had this much money in the bank i don't know where the money has gone but i have not spent that much money so if they lose the data you know there is no way that that can be cross checked within terms of what transactions happened and you know what um, transactions have taken place in your case in your bank account which then will help them prove that this money has been you know or has been debited or has been sent up to 1 2 3 4 five transactions that you've done so here if the financial industry within the financial industry which is the bank for example in your case is up losing your financial transactions there is no way that you know there will be a track of what was in what was coming out and you know what was uh, in savings and things like that so here these agencies or these companies have to look at securing once they get access to the information and the information gets created on a daily basis because of the transactions they are doing by the use of your debit card or your shopping or things like that they have to be all securely stored so that it can be processed at the end of the month into a meaningful statement called the monthly statement you know your monthly bank mm-hmm. statement yeah. and here they have to maintain not only the information but security of that information and also the confidentiality of that information so that it is something which is easily accessible as and when you want at a at a at, at any instant at a touch of a button and this particular bit is basically you know the act of building uh, the information databases through which they are able to uh, you know not only store the information but securely store it and access it at a touch of a button uh, uh, for those people who have access to it so as a consumer it's your bank account you are able to access it through a online banking by getting into the branch maybe getting a bank mm-hmm. statement through the door in the post uh, at the end of the month and yeah. if you in, step into any bank branch anywhere in the world that access to your information is pretty much available after you put in a bit of password or maybe your chip and pin uh, you know your debit card and things like that mm-hmm. so in some cases information has to be secured stored safely so that it can be reused and it keeps track of the transactions that you have done and if these are lost then in there in in, the, in that case there is no way they will be able to you know trace or understand where the money has gone or where the money has uh, you know uh, been spent yeah. and this is more so important in the case of you know when we look at um, e-commerce so currently we do a lot of shopping online we lot we do a lot of buying and selling of services online and this is one of the most important features which most e-commerce website incorporate is the storage and secure storage of information specifically so that because it is related to financial matters it needs to be retrie- retrieved securely and also stored securely so that at any given point in time if you need that in the future it can be straight away brought up at a touch of a button 
And an example here is when we use sites like Amazon and eBay, you store your credit card number or your debit card number once, and you can keep buying by putting in your CVV number at a click of a button. So it's a three-click system. You search, you uh, you know add to the basket, and uh, at the but touch of a button, you, you you just buy it, and it debits your card automatically. Correct. So here, the e-commerce side of things, you know, make it easy, but also they need to look at storage of this information securely. Okay. <clears throat> so in this case, you know, what we are looking at is, if I stick to the example of e-commerce, what we are looking at is when you buy something on Amazon, you're only placing the order, you know, um, in in the virtual marketplace but at some stage this information once you have transacted has to be stored has to be retrieved by the company or the uh, provider who's providing you the services and then that same information has to be used by a logistics company to be able to ship that product to you at, the, at your home or at your office so amazon has a lot of shops online when you buy from any particular store the central database of Amazon stores all the information, gets hold of it, and then in the background, it passes the information to the relevant company to be able to fulfill that order. Once the order is ready for dispatch, the logistic company picks up that information and delivers the product to the warehouse. From the warehouse, it goes out to your, uh, you know, to your address that you've provided for shipping, and that then typically becomes the logistics company's role. So if you look at, in this whole complex procedure, it, for you, you're ordering something online on the Amazon website, but there are lots of things which are happening in the background and lots of pieces of information are being shared between different types of organization to effectively execute and deliver your order at your doorstep, maybe in two days time, three days time, depending on what delivery method you've chosen, X day, Prime, or you know, standard two, two, three delivery, something like that. So information is not just taken, it is processed, it is stored and then it is retrieved a number of, number of times securely by different companies to kind of fulfill that transaction, right? So there are risks yeah. associated with this information, uh, you know, at every given stage, and that is where securing or information secure uh, security has to be maintained while third-party agencies get access to that data and access it and, you know, obviously process it. So Amazon would have details of your card, but the logistics partner or the supplier who's actually selling the product on Amazon might not need the access to the card or the information stored on the card, correct? So levels of information then are also created, which are then appropriately shared at different levels with different kind of providers access, uh, you know, accessing that information to be able to fulfill the order, correct? Yep. Yeah. Okay, now, <clears throat> last but not the least, what we also look at is, you know, um, the concept. So there are two, three other concepts that I will basically talk about, which are associated with risks and how we minimize these risks. Things like, you know, sometimes you have software piracy, which is a big issue in the industry. Now, if you use pirated software, nothing is guaranteed. But yes, if you are using genuine software, and uh, that genuine software provides you support. You know, there are other benefits which are associated with it. So some companies, when they sell certain software pieces of products or software, they say, okay, they, it does this, it does that. What they also tend to do is they tend to support you with training and development. They also tend to provide you free updates. And the reason why they do this is because you're paid up for these services and these paid up services also give you associated benefits uh, you know, in the future, which is getting hold of free updates and, you know, uh, any any yeah. free updates coming into the software uh, will make the software more secure and you, at the end of the day, you know, feel more secure in using uh, that service or that particular type of service being provided by that application. And that makes the whole uh, process of risk, uh, you know, mitigating the risk or minimizing the risk. Now, so mm -hmm. these are things that we have to look at in primarily the learning outcome three. So what we have discussed today, just to summarize, is to understand some of the key pieces of legislation which have been introduced over uh, over the years by the government. So I'll send you a quick handout on some of the key legislation. Also, okay. what are the ethical and legal issues 
differentiation between ethical and legal issues these issues mm-hmm. could be uh, the ethical issues or uh, you know these uh, legal issues they create certain risks how these risks are minimized and these risks could be at the personal level at the organizational level and at some stage when it is at a it is affecting more than uh, you know uh, individual people or organizations then they become regulatory and that is where the government steps in and puts in these legislation to ensure that they have uh, you know rules uh, to be able to comply with if people break those uh, you know legislation or code of ethics then there are rules they can be taken to uh, can be applied which then allow them to be taken to legal proceedings or you know in ca- some cases court cases so if you use some pirated software that you know the law clearly states here that you can be fined up to 5000 pounds or you know 6 months in jail because using pirated software so these are things which are covered under this particular learning outcome 3 and that kind of brings us to the end of you know this particular session and then you know we have covered the unit to understand what is the role of it what kind of implication it has on society and uh, if we are using it now uh, we have to have a responsible attitude uh, as a as a digital citizen to be able to use some of these services and then have an adhere to certain code of ethics so that you know it makes it a safe transactable uh, you know virtual uh, space mm-hmm. okay yeah. so that is where i'm going to end this session today and um, what i will do is as i mentioned to you earlier i'll follow it up with uh, some sort of uh, you know a bit of a handout for you to read through uh, so that it gives you certain uh, you know more knowledge in terms of what we have covered in terms of the content uh, you know in learning outcome 3 okay okay now if you, what because i've done a bit of summary for you in this particular uh, slide in this particular session as well i'm going to try and send you a copy of the recording so my session to you would be to start to look at the assignment brief you know for this particular unit and then start to attempt uh, you know the assignment brief so that you are uh, you know in a position to um, you know let's put it this way develop the assignment the while the information that we've discussed is fresh mhm Okay. So in the Moodle, what you will see is this Word document, right? Let me show that to you. Mm-hmm. This Word document is what you will see in Moodle. This Word document, and this Word document primarily has, you know, the assignment brief which ATH has provided for this particular unit. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you can follow this brief to start developing a draft assignment. the task given in this and you know in the uh, say for example one second let me share my full screen now so task given in this one and this uh, unit specification briefs are exactly the same the only difference that you will get to see now you should be able to see both the windows sorry one second okay right so if you see this particular uh, assignment brief and if you see these tasks here they are pretty much the same the only difference is that in the word document what the uh, what has happened is they have given you a bit of a scenario for you to assume uh-huh. that you are working as an it supervisor in a small business and uh, you have been tasked with the uh, you know effort of looking at some of the it issues within the organization and then what they've done is divided into activities 1 2 and 3 which cover activity 1 is learning outcome 1 activity 2 is learning outcome 2 activity 3 is learning outcome 3 so it has